guys are all doing well today. Um, who knew that the ASMR Bells comeback would include two videos in a week? Certainly not I, but I have actually fallen ill with an inflamed esophagus. So, oddly enough, so I'm kind of out of commission for this week, I guess. Um, like I said earlier, there's hasn't really been much for me to do this week, so this is, I guess, contributing to that. But another thing I said in my last video was um, how badly I wanted to start making content based on, you know, music and books again, and was like, I'll probably start doing that when I get back to school. So I'm going to show you guys a couple CDs I've been interested in lately and books. Um, maybe talk about some other music that I've been listening to that I don't necessarily have physical copies of. Um, but what I have to show you is stuff that I've collected over the summer or in the school year. This isn't all that I've collected, but there's definitely a couple favorites in here. off with I have a couple books to show you guys this first one I checked out from the library so I'm not going to show you the pack because it has my library on it but it's Nora Ephron's I Feel Bad About My Neck I love how used library books smell and I really love when you can see um the other pages that past readers have bookmarked. Have bookmarked. Um, here's where I am uh, currently. Um, I highly recommend this book for particularly uh, female subscribers or watchers. Um, I don't really know how much <laughs> uh, a man enjoy this book, but because it, it is primarily about, I mean, I feel bad about my neck and other thoughts on being a woman. Um, she's such a witty writer. She's very, it's very easy to read her, um, kind of fast paced. I mean, they're, they're short little chapters about just kind of about all these woman things about feeling bad about your neck how much you hate and love your purse about your apartment and living in the city and let's see moving on serial monogamy I hate my purse maintenance beauty maintenance um, parenting that's I'm just reading the names of the chapters but um, this is the kind of book that it doesn't really make me think oh I love this book while I'm reading it while I'm reading it, I'm thinking, I love this woman. I love her, and she's sharing such collectively held thoughts that are, it's difficult to articulate those things, and she does such a good job at it, and she's just so funny and witty and smart, experienced. She's better known for um, When Harry Met Sally in Sleepless in Seattle. But, um, I think this personal writing is probably my favorite, so that's that. That's what I'm currently reading. <clears throat> the other book that I'm currently reading, and this is the only other one that I'm reading like right now, is Priscilla Presley's Elvis and Me. This is her memoir about her time with Elvis, um, an intimate story that could have been that could have been written only by the woman who lived it. Um, 
Here she is on the back. This is really just, it starts with Emily, about chapter 10, which is um, only after the first time she actually went to America to spend time with all this. Um, but yeah, there's some really interesting photos of her and Elvis, um, this era, like 1962 around, is where I'm at, um, but oh, just look at that, so beautiful, um, honestly, I, the writing is, it's very simple writing, um, it's not really like an intellectually charged book, but there still are, there, it still does cover a lot of serious topics like I mean drug abuse and uh just domestic abuse and all of Elvis's ailments and how she felt in that relationship and um it's it's just such an interesting story um that I mean it's one of a kind it's it truly is one of a kind um yeah that's just a personal interest, I guess. Um, and I found it at The Strand. 99. Okay, these next books are books that I've collected within the past year that I haven't finished, but um, are kind of on my TBR. Um, and I'm only going to talk briefly about these because I, because I haven't First is Susan Sontag's Regarding the Pain of Others. I read this really beautiful essay um, on that cited this book or that referenced this book and it was an essay about Joshua Oppenheimer's film The Act of Killing um, which I also watched and wrote about. Um, so I was reading other essays on the film and this one really stood out to me I mean I love I love I love Susan Sontag Susan Sontag Susan Sontag as a writer um, she has really profound work on women 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 and photography um, let's see it should have a book list in photography, her work on AIDS, um, her fiction in America. There's, she's wrote a ton and she's influenced so many of my favorite writers, musicians, actors. Um, highly influential. If you haven't read any of her work, I highly, highly suggest it. Um, and this one, let me read the introduction. One of the distinguishing features of modern life is that it supplies countless opportunities for regarding parentheses at a distance through the medium of photography or is taking place throughout the world. Images of atrocities have become something of a commonplace, but viewers are inured or incited to violence by the depiction of cruelty. Is the viewer's perception of reality eroded by the daily barrage of such images? And what does it mean to care about the sufferings of others far away? So it's kind of just an essay or a piece on that, and I'm just very excited to dive in. All right, this next book is from an author that highly acclaimed. I mean, I think, yeah, she's, she's won a Nobel Prize. You've all heard of her. It's none other than Toni Morrison, and this is one of her fiction books, Sula. I've actually never read a Toni Morrison book, um, which is my own fault, my own fault. Um, I, it's far too late to read your first Tony Morrison. Come on now. Um, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm really excited about this one. It's about two girls, let's see, Mel Wright and Sue Lapice in Ohio. Okay, it's about a friendship. Yeah. I don't, I couldn't really give a proper summary of this, but this is the piece of fiction that I'm probably 
definitely most excited about because the other books that I've shown you haven't been fiction. All right, next is Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. Um, I haven't read this yet. It's pretty. It's pretty hefty. Um, I haven't read this yet is because I think Tropic of Capricorn comes first and I don't want to read this before I read the first one. I'll have to double check but I'm pretty sure that this is kind of the second and like a duo of books. So yeah and I can't really say much about this but the preface is by his, there was kind of a long and when, he had kind of a long and winded, winded up relationship with Benayas Neen. And that leads me to my next book, which is one of her diaries. This is um, volume one, 1931 to 1934. Wow, those are, that is an interesting set of Um, Little Birds, also, and I also want to read Delta of Venus, let's see. This is the introduction. These are just, I, I assume these are, these are just her diaries, um, I don't, sometimes I feel weird about reading diaries, but these are widely published, I don't to say the wrong thing or say give you false information but I'm pretty sure I mean, these are something that she was okay with being put out I mean I'll have to double check on that but I would never read like Kurt Cobain's journals or anything like that I personally feel weird about it I don't think other people I'm not judging other people for doing that but it's just not really something that I feel necessary um, but I, I admire this woman so much and more books. This next one I'm not going to talk about much because I think I've already talked about her in some of my other videos, but it's none other than Joan Didion. Um, and this is The Year of Magical Thinking. This is, I mean, a widely read book. Many of my friends, teachers, peers, family members have read her work, and particularly this book. A stunning book of electric honesty and passion. Joan Didion explores an intensely personal yet universal experience, a portrait of marriage and a life in good times and bad that will speak to anyone who has ever loved a husband or wife or child. She is a fantastic essayist and I have read actually a lot of her other work, so it's kind of surprising that I haven't dabbled in this one yet. I haven't read anything from this book yet, but I've read Blue Nights, Play It As It Lays. I haven't read Slouching Towards Bethlehem, but I've also read, let's see, what's one other one? Not Salvador, that one. I just read one of her books. Was it this one? I don't remember. I don't remember what else I read. The title of it, but it was another one of her kind of famous essay collections. It had the one short story about um, her in Columbia and her at the greenhouse. So if you look up like greenhouse Joan Didion essay, then the book that it's in, it'll probably lead you to that, but she's one of my favorite writers. intellectual hard to read book so I'm a little bit 
hesitant to dive in. It's not really something you can dive into easily. I feel like you have to set your mind to it. This is, you know, discipline and punishment. This is where I think the famous, famous idea of the panopticon is talked about. Let's see if it, yeah, panopticism, which is just a heavy idea. I mean, such a small print. This is definitely going to be a mission and then an accomplishment if I finish it, but yeah, it's just the birth of prison, like a very heavy stuff. Um, hopefully it's something that I can be motivated by when I go back to school. Um, but yeah, I know it's very useful. It's useful to cite in any of my future I hope to be able to use it in maybe some future writing or future just thinking and being able to expand my thought bubble, I guess. Um, and honestly, there's part of me that's not excited because some books like this uh, leave you behind with ideas that bring you pain and thoughts and and facts and histories that you can't really escape from once you learn them. So there's a sense of fear that I feel upon going into books like this, but I mean, it's incredibly important to, like I said, expand your thought bubble with stuff like that. So with unpleasant and uncomfortable ideas. So yeah, I guess. When I become mentally stable enough to jump into something like that, I'll let you guys know how it is. This next book before I move on to CDs is something that I wouldn't have picked out if I didn't, if I wasn't in school. And I bought this at the Orsay Museum. Someone's pulling into my house right now bought this at the Musée d'Orsay in France, in Paris, which is going to Paris this year for the first time was honestly, I may have to make another video about it and just ramble about it. It was, it was truly a dream come true. Um, and at the Orsay, I had to pick up some art criticism from one of my favorite art writers. <clears throat> or art historians Griselda Pollock. And this is this is her work on the highly controversial Gauguin. Um, Paul Gauguin. I this, let's let's just read the back. Acclaimed feminist art historian Griselda Pollock unpacks the racist, sexist, and imperialist underpinnings of paintings by Paul Gauguin and others vying for dominance of the European artistic avant-garde of the 1880s and the 1890s. First delivered as a lecture in 1993, this essay remains a powerful repost to mainstream art historical narratives by a long-standing advocate of gender and racial inclusivity. So if you don't know much about Gauguin, he was a painter during the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was a French painter who traveled to Tahiti and, uh, let's see, what was the other? Started with an M and where else did he travel? It was Tahiti and I'm trying to find it, but it was a country I s it was a French colonized country that I learned about in an Impressionism class I took that actually introduced me to Pollock's work. Pollock wrote about Manet and Manet's Olympia and um, she critiques art through a feminist lens and she wrote about, she introduced me to painters such as Mary Cassatt and I'm forgetting the names. I'm forgetting the names. That's no good. That's no good. Oh, Beth Morisot. Um, 
and just compares them to male painters at the times and the themes they were taking on. Um, and painting is just incredibly important to me. And I mean, I, I consider myself a very political person and I like to view art, you know, in a political context. I mean, it's important to have times where you're looking at art just with your eye as a viewer and taking in sensations and just the image itself but I mean there's other times where a layered perspective is very important and um, this is definitely will supply you with that um, I don't think that this is something that is just beneficial for women to read I mean it, it talks about more than just feminism I mean I've read this to you it's it's about racism and imperialism and colonization and kind of narratives of discovery and narratives of I mean primitivism and exoticism that um, Western explorers just slapped on top of these um, island countries and communities um, so yeah very move on to the CDs, a little more light-hearted. I have four physical CDs to show you, and then I may talk about a little bit about some albums. First, we have an essential album of all time. An essential. This is Songs of Leonard Cohen. And beautiful artwork inside. Let's see, this is, everyone watching this has probably heard Suzanne at least once, and this is on this album, but I, this album actually really helped me through heartbreak and loneliness at school. It's very profound and poetic, and Leonard Cohen is just a singer-songwriter that, whose, whose prose cannot be replicated, I mean you can there's so much that's been influenced and inspired by him but truly nothing that kind of twists the knife into your soul like his poetry does um if you haven't heard this i mean this is the kind of thing that will change your life and will change how you listen to music and how you take in poetry and lyrics and it will never allow you to believe that lyrics don't matter um and obviously i'm a fan of lots of instrumental and jazz music but it really will make you appreciate the poetry aspect of songwriting and look at him i mean look at him staring at you with those seductive eyes i mean leonard Cohen, just a, a man a, a man of his age, who, yeah, anyways, that's songs of Leonard Cohen. Let's see, next was a gift, <laughs> actually a gift, which is just such a thoughtful gift because she's one of my favorite artists. This is PJ Harvey's Is This Desire. This is one of my favorite albums of hers. And it comes with some of the tracks I love are Joy, which honestly the demo version is even better. Um, A Perfect Day Elise and Angeline. This was recorded after her breakup with Nick Cave, I'm pretty sure. Here's the CD, here's the disc, and then some artwork that's inside. Ooh, beautiful photo of BJ. Um, and yeah, this is one of my favorite albums. Um, I have a pretty steady PJ collection now. I have actually one more CD of hers to show you next. Um, and I'm going to see her um, next week, actually. She doesn't do many shows in the US, but she's doing a couple here and I could not be more excited. 
I've never seen one of my like top five artists before and she's like a top like she's in my top three possibly favorite artist ever so I'm just so excited like I don't have CDs and vinyls of other artists like I do hers I mean I have like six or seven things that six or seven uh, physical copies of her music so I'm just so excited I'm so excited and that brings me to my next CD which is a single um her and John Parrish have created some amazing music together particularly I love their song Black Hearted Love but um I found this single at a Buckman's nearby and it comes with the songs That Was My Veil, Losing, Cr Losing Ground, Civil War Correspondent, and Who Will Love Me Now. It's kind of a different material. Not a typical CD case. And yeah, here's the inside. certainly not least. I kind of paid a pretty penny for this because I usually won't go over $10 for a CD. Like, it's weird that I'll even buy a CD over $7 or $8. Like, the sweet spot for me is like 5 or 6 But, um, this one was $17. Which, if you're a CD collector, maybe that's not super weird for you, but you know that it's a little bit harder to come by. This is Captain Beefheart's Trout Mask Replica. This is kind of an if you know, you know. It's not on streaming services, really. I think you could find it on YouTube. I mean, obviously it's listenable online, but it's not on Spotify or Apple, that's for sure. And a CD is kind of hard to come by, I guess. Especially not at just like, I got this at a record fair. I mean, you're not really gonna, I mean, maybe you'll find it in your CD store, but it's a good day. familiar with Captain Beefheart. He made music for many years. This was in, this one was in 1970 and it just has such a long track list. What he was doing was so different from anyone else at the time. It's just so unique. Um, I don't really, oh, produced by Frank Zappa too. So if you're a Zappa fan, get on this, get on this. Um, I don't want to give away too much about his sound because I don't even know if my description could do it justice. I honestly think it's just something that you need to dive into blindly and just be engulfed in his strangeness. And that's actually all I have to show you. Physically, I have a couple other albums that I was thinking of talking about. Let me just actually... just write a couple of names of these albums down. These are just some recent recommendations I'm going to share with you. I don't really have much time to, because I was only planning on making a 30 minute video and you guys don't need to hear me ramble about different musics like without even like a sound assortment. Um, let's see, I've been listening to the new Molly Nelson album, hopefully giving you a couple of writing sounds. Um, and I'm gonna write these down so you guys can maybe screenshot them. Okay, and Cindy Lee's Diamond Jubilee, you, that's also not on streaming services, but it's an amazing like two hour epic album that you can, it's like exclusively on YouTube or you have to like pay to have it. Um, but Diamond Jubilee, Molly Nelson's new album. Let's see, oh, The Stranglers, Feline. Maybe I can add this to the description. I just like wanted to get the writing sounds in, I guess. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just compensating for like not tapping and just rambling. Um, <clears throat> this 
Stranglers, let's see. The Jane Birkin and Search Gainsbourg collab album is also really good. Okay. Okay. Yes. I do. I, I do have a couple things. I've been listening to this new, if you're into, I know this is not really maybe what you would expect based on the music I, I've recommended thus far, but um, if you're into that new snow stripper type of music, um, there is a group called Bass Victim, and I've been listening to their album. Let's see what it's called. Bass Punk. Let's find some songs too. Actually, never mind. Maybe I'll just plug an Apple Music playlist because there's just so many songs. Like, I just add so many songs, like, every day. I'm always listening to music. So, yeah, here's here's what I'm leaving you guys with. The new Molly Nelson album, the Cindy Lee Diamond Jubilee, the Stranglers Feline, and Bass Victim, Bass Punk. I guess, like, maybe you could, like, swap the, swap the thing. And, yeah, I, again, I love the I've been loving the shit it's the song's called Je Them uh Moi non plus. Uh it's the Jane Jane Bergen song um with Serge and I just I just love them and I know it's like their most popular song but I've never actually like listened to their music. I have this like little frame in my